You got the call. Welcome to the big leagues, kid. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Call-Up, presented by Triple Play Fantasy. We are now in week four, and this is the week of injuries, because right before we recorded, we're talking, and everybody's favorite Ricky Tiedemann, right now expected to probably be getting Tommy John surgery. Uh, Major leagues, there's a ton of pitching injuries. Robbie Ray is going to get Tommy John surgery. You have guys missing starts. Vince Velasquez, even if you want to even go that deep, guys like him are getting pulled after three innings from starts. Uh, it's been bad, just the pitching landscape in general in terms of injuries. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're at a minor leagues or a major leaguer. It's just the unfortunate part of one of the games we love. Um, but Michael and Vinny are here as always, and we've got a ton of players that are healthy and that are going to help your dynasty rosters and players that if you just enjoy watching prospects rise up through the ranks that uh, are very much on their way. But before we get started, Mike, how are you doing tonight? Doing good, Mindy. Always happy to be here. Like I was saying, still my favorite part of each week. Uh, just love doing this, even though I put in a lot of hard work to each week. Uh, we did have a great guest lined up for you guys this week, uh, but we had to reschedule for next week. You know, life happens, but uh, happy to be here. And we got the original three going at it this week. How are you doing, Vinny? I'm doing good. You know, add fuel to the fire to the uh, prospect injury dilemma you know we saw daniel spino just had mm-hmm. shoulder surgery again he's done for at least another year it sucks but you know now it's time to start digging for the next big pitchers and that's what we're here for pitchers hitters players that we want you to make sure that you've got your eye on and uh as you know we always kick things off here as we get started into the next week week four with our players of the week and our first player here is moises ballesteros of the Chicago Cubs catching prospect overall on the season uh, in 79 plate appearances, He's got a 297 batting average, four home runs, 12 RBIs and 148 WRC plus. And over the last week, 15 plate appearances, he's got a 400 batting average and a home run to boot there. Vinny uh, of your Chicago Cubs. Again, you, you, would, I mean, you watch a lot of prospects, but obviously your Cubs are uh, somebody you're I got a special eye on here. Uh, what should we know about Moises Ballesteros and his projected future? Yeah, we could do a little flashback. Um, one of our sleeper, you know, breakout prospect videos, I did mention Ballesteros after he had a very hot Arizona complex league, and they were very aggressive and sent him straight to low A last year. But no, this year he has come out on fire. Like, you know, when you look at his frame, he's about, you know, five seven two thirty ish. He's an absolute whoa. You know, mammoth of a person, but his bat looks like one of the most advanced bats that we have in our system right now. Like a little cool stat here: uh, if we're looking at MILB uh, teenagers, so players under the age of twenty, him and only Jackson Holiday have a swinging strike percentage under ten percent and an ISO over two hundred. Uh, wow. To put him in the company of Jackson Holiday and how crazy he has been to start this season, that just shows on what kind of a season he's having. You know, he's probably limited. I I would say he's limited to either, you know, a, being a catcher or a first baseman. But, you know, the comp I dropped on him back in whenever that was November was Josh Naylor. And let me tell you, he looks... It looks like that comp's going to pan out. He might, I would say he might even have a little better hit tool than Josh Naylor, but I would expect him pretty soon to get a bump to high A South Bend. Like he's just torn up pitching in low A right now. He's just can't be, he just can't be put out. Wow. He hit a a couple home, uh, he hit a home run this week that was absolutely insane on some like Prince Fielder type of. (laughs) you know, showboating, like uh, he's a really quiet name right now. And I tell you, if he continues the success to a promotion in South Bend, you're going to see him start flying up 
you know, lists very quickly. I mean, you talk about the power that's in that bat. You talk about just the overall comparison of what he could be. It sounds very tantalizing, the the prospect here. And uh, Mr. Ballesteros, is there any right now, Vinny, catching prospects that are ahead of him in terms of so like where he does eventually get up to the big league club? Is there anybody that could block him? Uh, for the Cubs, no. I uh, Maybe Miguel Amaya, but I don't think if his bat is what it's looking like it could be, I don't think anyone blocks him. Unless, you know, the Cubs draft a catcher this year and this year's draft. Mm -hmm. But like right now, I think he's the catcher of the future. All right. That's good to know. Let's then move on to somebody who used to be part of the Twins future and it was sent to the Cincinnati Reds in what has been, in my opinion, one of the worst trades that's not talked about recently. Just for the context, the Twins got Tyler Molly who is barely pitched for them, has had a lot of shoulder and uh, mostly shoulder troubles. Uh, but at the time, I was not very happy with the trade because they gave up Spencer Steer, who's getting regular at-bats for them, the Cincinnati Reds, Steve Hajar, and Christian Encarnacion Strand. Now, if you told me this was for Sonny Gray, I'd be like, okay, but this was for Tyler Molly. Meanwhile, Christian Encarnacion Strand in AAA right now uh, on the season, a 4-10 452, 769 slash line, four home runs, nine RBIs. The K rate, which people might be concerned about, at 21.4% right now with a 359 ISO here, Mike. Um, people might have even thought he would have broken, you know, uh, spring training with the club or that he would have been up by now. I know that I've gotten a couple DMs about when we can expect Christian Encarnacion Strand. Uh, what are your thoughts into when we could potentially see him and just overall, what do you think of his profile? Yeah, you said a lot of great things there. Uh, I think Christian Encarnacio Strand kind of came on the redraft radar this spring training and he was kind of pushing for a spot. Uh, but going back last year, he had a great season. He hit 33 or 32 home runs in 122 games. Uh, he was good the year before too, but he was kind of dismissed because of his age at the time. Uh, so he's been productive throughout his minor league career. The, the reason he has 42 plate appearances this year is because of injury. He's coming back. And like you said, he's hot right out the gate. I've said this about other players on the Reds, but they don't have a lot of talent there. I think uh, as soon as they deem that he's ready to go, I think he's the next guy they're going to call up on the offensive side. I think he's going to be a mainstay in their lineup going forward. Um, like you said, he was part of that Tyler Molly trade, which is already looking good for the Reds. Uh, he profiles more as a third base guy right now, but he may end up at first in, or DH long term. Uh, the one the one thing you mentioned about his approach, he's never had a walk rate above 9% in any level. And so there is some average risk with him, but the power is legitimate. You know, one of the tools I use during draft season, you know, especially this year, is I looked at the zips, uh, three-year averages. And, you know, when you look at enough prospects, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of how they would translate to the major leagues. And this guy's power is legitimate. Like he's projected to, to be a 30 home run hitter if he gets placed into the major leagues as soon as this year. He And his average actually projects to be pretty good too. I don't think he's going to be the huge like 35% strikeout rate that some people are, are suggesting. I think, I don't think he's going to walk a lot, but I do think he's going to be an average, like maybe even help. Like he's projected to be 255, 260 average. So if you do that with 30 home runs, I don't think speed's going to be part of it, but that's going to be valuable. I think people are going to be interested in him this year, as they should be. And as I said, he's been productive throughout his career. He's already 23, going on 24. You know, I think he's the type of guy who could kind of translate and be helpful immediately if he comes up too. So, I, like I said, I think he might even already be up if he would have wouldn't have gotten hurt. So, it it could happen anytime. I thought about putting him in the call up, but the reason I who's next for the call up, but the reason I didn't was because. I'm guessing he's not going to be called up within the next week. So maybe a little teaser for next week that he could be the guy for Mike there. Uh, but yeah, a, an absolute baller, Christian Encarnacion Strand, and definitely a heist here by the Cincinnati Reds. And he's going to be a big part of that Reds team that's looking to eventually contend one of these days. They've got obviously some great young pitching and some young hitters that are coming up the pipeline here. So Keep an eye on Christian Encarnacion Strand in your redraft and your dynasty leagues. Next player, Jefferson uh, Kiro of the Milwaukee Brewers. Another catcher here, Vinny. So you got some catching fever tonight, I can tell. Um, 
15 plate appearances over the last week. He's hitting 333 with three home runs on the season. And, and right now he's at double A, only 20 years of age. He's got a 255 batting average and a 383 OBP, two home runs, five ribbies, and a steal to boot here. Another guy, just like Christian and Canarsian Strand, with a low walk rate right now, only 4.1% on the season here. Um, but again, you've got the catching fever tonight, Vinny. So you you had your uh, you had your idea coming in here. Do you think that Mr. Kiro could be somebody that uh, should be on everybody's radar right now? Yeah, I I think Cuero going into the season this year really blew up stock wise because he was invited he was a non-roster invite to the brewers in um, spring training but similar to last year cuero you know he had a very slow start to carolina and you know around mid-may early june he really kicked it into gear you know was batting 350 plus showing out some power he was actually stealing some bases too which we haven't started seeing yet but it's he's following the same track that he did last year you know, he had a slow 50, you know, or uh, 30 some plate appearances, you know, a little get adjusted to double A. He's 20 years old at double A. He's already starting to show that he can catch up and start timing double A pitching. If he really starts going on a tear here, we could potentially see him at triple A before age 21 season. Wow. Quero, you know, he's going to be, you know, solid across the board. He has a very good hit tool, very good power. You know, he just isn't that patient at the plate, which if you're going to hit for power and average and potentially steal, you know, 10 bags a year, I really don't care about your walks. <laughs> but yeah, the Brewers are in need of a catcher. They've already shown that they're very aggressive with his, you know, his track. I like Cuero. I know he's probably one of the hotter names right now in the Brewers system ever since, you know, Jackson Churio took the world by storm, but. I think he's still in his shadow and I still think you can get him fairly cheap. And like I said, you know, if he does get off to that hot start and really does kick it into gear, maybe we even see him as a late September call up. Mm. Like I, I guarantee we will see him next year in the majors, you know, potentially could break camp. Maybe, you know, late May, let's manipulate his service time candidate, but you're talking about, you know, solid catcher with some upside and, you know, it's hard to find those. So yeah, Cuero definitely go try and get him very quickly. Cause you know, he's, he could potentially be, you know, that Andy Rodriguez of this year, the stock goes through the roof and he's next year's hyped catcher, which I will add the Quer both Queros, you know, uh, the angels Quero and Jefferson, you know, they're, I don't think they're related. I didn't check, but. Don't get mix matched. Don't don't mix them up. I think um it's interesting too because right now obviously the Brewers have William Contreras at the major league level, but he's also shown. I, I have to check what his contract says in terms of how long he's probably going to be with the team. But even if he is with the team, they he's shown that he can play left field too. So that would could also give a path for uh, Cuero to have that playing time if there's nobody again blocking him to become their catcher of the future. So that's an important yeah. note there. And yeah, um, yeah. Okay, and Vinny. last year at the fall league showed that he could potentially be a gold glove caliber type of catcher. Like I'm pretty sure he, he led the fall league last year in uh, runners caught. Like he has some scary tools and let me tell you, he's going to, he's going to make some noise in that NL central for a, a bunch of years to come. Wow, that's going to be exciting to watch when he's uh, part of that big league club and helping the Brewers out there. They definitely could use his offense. And obviously, being a gold glove catcher, that definitely does not hurt either. Uh, Mike, let's go to your Seattle Mariners. Let's talk about Jonathan Classe, an outfielder in their organization and high A ball. Vinny is very much approving of this young player. 21 years of age and high A ball. 106 plate appearances on the season. He's got seven bombs and 17 steals. 17% walk rate, the 368 ISO. Uh, I don't remember if we've ever talked about him on the show because we've talked about so many Mariners prospects. It's unbelievable what they have. Uh, but the numbers don't lie, and Seattle just seems like they can just breed so many outfielders. Yeah, like you said, Vinny actually did bring him up uh, two weeks ago, and I hesitated to bring him up because it's been so close, but he's actually been on a tear 
five home runs and six steals this week. So I thought it was a good time. Now, this is a kid going back to like 2020 that I was talking about on Twitter a lot, probably well before he deserved it. But it's kind of all coming to fruition right now, even better than I imagined. I was kind of starting to get a little skeptical relative to my original expectations, but his power has appeared. When I look at fan graphs, it says he has a below average hit tool, 30, 30 grade game power with 80 grade speed. So like I said, two weeks ago, Vinny mentioned, I think this is one of the most legitimate speed threats in the minor leagues. Mm-hmm. I think he's going to steal as many bases as he's allowed to, depending on how high he hits up in the order. The issues with him is the power, which we're seeing right now. This is a, uh, incredible power compared to what he was projected for. And I should point out too, because I've been talking about it for so long, he's actually one of the people, the prospects that follows me on Twitter early on. Oh, so I've, been, I've been kind of watching him Whoa. Uh, develop since he was 16 years old. He was listed at five, seven, 140 pounds when he signed. And I tried to get a picture that best represented him, but you can see he's bulky. He's yeah. a, he's a pretty big guy right now. He's really strong. I've seen him working out a lot. He's ripped super fast. Very exciting player here. The issue, in my opinion, is the strikeout rate. It's still not terrible. I mean, it's right around where it was last year. I think he stole about 55 bases last year, but 27. I'd like to see that come down a little bit, but every other aspect of his game is looking like a fantasy star to me. And this is a guy that wasn't ranked in the top 300 on most lists. I know Vinny said he's had him in the top 100 for a while, but most lists don't even have him ranked in the top 300. I think that's going to change once they start coming out. This is a guy I would recommend picking up, even if there's just too much fantasy goodness coming together here. Even if the hit tool isn't ideal, what we want is power and speed in players. Mm-hmm. This guy has some of the best speed that there is, and the power is looking, I mean, a 360-something ISO, like that's completely different than anything he's shown us before. So I don't necessarily think that's what's happened, where he's become the super power guy, but it's showing me that there's enough power in his game where it's going to be part part of his game. So he's not going to be an empty speed guy. So I just really like this guy, especially now that he's getting closer to the major leagues. And I, I just really think you should target him in any road to league because I think his speed's going to be a game changer. This is almost starting to turn into this year's Estuary Ruiz for me early. It's still early, oh. but you know we're turning, we're doing this, we're bringing him up two times in the first four shows. Yeah, and I try to talk about as many different guys as I can, but he's the early favorite for. The, the player of the show this year. So if you missed him a few weeks ago when he was brought up, make sure you note Jonathan Class A of the Seattle Mariners. He is This is why we do this show. The fact that he's not on top 100 lists, Vinny has him in his top 100. Mike's brought him up again, talking about, you know, again, not just speed anymore. The power is now there. Uh, these are the type of breakthroughs that only people that dig deep uh, into the prospects can see this early on before the kind of the rest of the world catches up. So if there is a player, it seems like you can take from this show, it might be Jonathan class say, so keep an eye on him. Even if you're in a dynasty league, maybe you can, uh, you can buy low on him before anybody realizes just how valuable he is. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to just keep an eye on that. Yeah. If, uh, if you guys get really bored watching this, go back. We have talked about him a couple of times. I want to kind of make a, like a montage of how he's progressed. <laughs> Because we've talked about him a lot, and let me tell you, he is he's a, he's a stud, guys. All right, let's talk about another stud, Dominic Hamill of the New York Mets, a righty in their organization right now at Double A. This last week, he had a five inning start, eight Ks in that start, only one run allowed on five hits on the season. Eighteen innings, a two eighteen ERA, one WHIP, which is always stands out to me. The WHIP is something that especially if, if they can keep their base runners under control early on is a good sign. And he's got those 27 strikeouts to go with that. Uh, so a lot of great things here, Vinny in Dominic Hamill, obviously right now in double a 24 years of age. So a little bit of an older prospect in terms of other guys. I feel like that we see at that level. Uh, do you think he could be somebody that uh, could help the Mets down the road? And, and what do you get a sense of his outlook? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hamill, you know, he was a big uh, off speed, a uh, big slider fastball guy coming out of the 21 draft out of Dallas Baptist, fell to the third round. You know, just watching this kid last year, he was, you know, 23 playing, you know, in high A. So you had to take everything he did with a grain of salt. 
Uh, I did mention him last uh, earlier this year when I did uh, the Welsh's early P180Ps. He was my last pick in that. And he was the guy that I touted this year that he needs to be watched. Watching him reminds me so much of Hayden Wesneski, just how he controls and how nasty his slider fastball mix is really insane. Uh, I've seen he has been using the cha- his changeup more this year. He's put a little work into it. It's still a solid offering, but we're talking about a Mets organization right now that cannot put anything together right now. It, it would not surprise me if, you know, they just jump him up for a spot start or something coming, mm-hmm. you know, in the near future. Like he's that advanced that I think, you know, you know, skipping out on some triple A is not going to hurt him. Like he's pretty legit and he's very slept on right now. Like you could probably go pick him up off the waiver wire. But, you know, what he's showing out early is, you know, he's probably at the next level, probably a, you know, three, four starter. But we're looking at a guy with strikeout upside to the moon. That's fantastic. Strikeout upside is kind of, I think, music to everybody's ears. And then again, the the one whip, the fact that he's keeping base runners under control again. I, I it seems like there's a lot to like here. Vinny, um, do you have any, like, what's his... Is he just like a, a high velocity guy? Is he locate well? What's the best thing that you've found in his profile? You know, he sits mid, you know, 93, 94 with a fastball. But like I said, he locates the way he locates his fastball and how he, you know, he follows it up with his slider. His slider is absolutely nasty. Like 65 grade slider. Like he can locate that and dot that like crazy. Like the two pitches that he works with, he's like a magician with. I also remember Hamill from when he got drafted and I haven't been able to look at the data since then, but he was touted for being a really big spin rate kind of guy. So I think, I think his stat cast stuff is going to look really good. Even if he doesn't have a huge fastball, I think, I think he's going to be effective. And I think everything Vinny said is correct. I think he, he could jump up to the majors pretty soon. They've kind of slow played him, but I think he'll be on the team next year in, in the rotation for the Mets next year. All right, that again, that is Dominic Hamill. Our last player of the week is Christian Mena of the Chicago White Sox. I, we don't have too many White Sox on here. I, I see that that team, and um, it's kind of throwing me off a little bit. Uh, 20 years of age in AA right now. In four games this season, 19 innings with 31 strikeouts. Uh, that's what definitely jumps at the 38.3% K rate and 228 XFIP show that there's a lot to like here. Uh, the 125 whip. Could be a little bit better. And um, Mike, to close out the player of the weeks here, uh, what about him stood out to you? Well, that's a good question because I'm not super familiar with him. I mean, I heard of him last year. He kind of came on my radar as someone who was being pushed quickly. He was he was a teenager still and, and having relative success. So the age versus level stuff kind of stood out to me. But I mean, looking at his scouting grades, he's got a below average fastball plus curveball below average change up with above average command. I, from what I'm seeing from this guy, I I just don't think those are accurate. I'm not sure exactly what his scouting grades would be, but his, his success so far as a professional has been too good for those to be accurate. The thing that stood out for me was doing my stuff that I talk about frequently is filtering players by age versus level and qualified pitchers that are 20 years old or younger in double A. There's only one other player. It's Yuri Perez. So when you have a guy who's, Yuri Perez, who's a well-known player, top five pitching prospect because of his age level. And then you also have this other guy who has a better XFIP at the same age and level as as Yuri Perez early. You know, his ERA and whip isn't on the same level yet, but, and I don't trust the White Sox organization. So I'm hesitant to, to say anything too crazy about this, but there are very few pitchers in the minor leagues this young who are pushed up to the upper levels and have success. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to all unfold, but what I can assure you is if he continues being successful, he's going to be a pitcher that people start talking about quite a bit. And his relatively low ownership rate right now is going to skyrocket because he's been successful throughout his career. Just looking at stats right here, he's always had, you know, 11 Ks per nine, and he's always been young for the level two. I don't think there's a lot of concerns here. He he looks to me like he might even have better command than people think and better pitches than people think. And so this is someone that I would roster without even knowing what's going on or how it's going to play out and not even liking the team necessarily. I still would just get him on 
the team. Cause like I said, 20 year olds, 20 year old pitchers being successful in the upper levels is rare. So that alone is makes him worth picking up. All right. Make sure you keep an eye on Christian mania. Uh, now we are going to go to our prospect promotions players that got the call over the last week. Headlined by Matt Mervis, who just got the call today for the Chicago Cubs. Finally, uh, the Matt Mervis hype was all over the place in the offseason, and he did not make it with the big league club, but now he's going to get his chance after he was putting up pretty good numbers in AAA. Brandon Fat got his chance, and let's say uh, he didn't. Uh, Fat did not deliver uh, seven earned runs, I think, in, in three innings, three or four innings. So, a little bit of a, a bruise on that debut, but obviously one of the most talented young pitchers in the game, so he'll bounce back. Same with Gavin Stone, who made his debut, and I picked him up for a spot start and gave up four earned runs, so not necessarily his best look there at his first go. Bryce Miller, on the other hand, pitched against the Oakland A's and just gave you 10 strikeouts in six shutout innings, or six innings, I think he gave up one run on two hits, something like that. I'm pretty sure that was the final line. Uh, with zero walks, which was also a big deal. People that are going to say it was the Oakland A's, but if you do that against a major league lineup, I don't care who you're facing in your debut. That's pretty awesome. And then Miguel Amaya of the Chicago Cubs, the last player to get some big league action this week. I do want to throw in real quick before yes. we move on. Those guys, if you would have asked the average person a week ago, like how those guys are going to be bid on, they would have said Fott was going – the highest for the highest amount of money, then Stone, then Miller. Mervis wasn't in the mix yet, but this just shows how quickly things can change within fantasy, the perception of players. You know, this is why it's important to actually look at the player, look in deeply at them, and then look at it from a long-term perspective. Any pitcher can get blown up in a start. You know, it's it's just, I just wanted to point that out. You know, Bryce Miller was in double A this time last week, and no one was had him on his radar, and he's probably going to be going for triple-digit bids this week, and it may work out. And, and, but the Brandon Fott bids are going to be lower. The Gavin Stone bids are going to be lower. And if you're a believer in those guys, I would suggest to still making a move for them. Yeah, definitely. I, Mike spits the truth there. Um, prospect watch players that we're keeping an eye on, mostly in the lower levels here. Uh, we're going to go to our first guy, Cooper Kinney of the Tampa Bay Rays. And right now in A-ball, 20 years of age. He's got two home runs on the season and 49 plate appearances uh, obviously, again, we, we're digging deep here, Vinny, and taking a look at this kid, what about him made you want to uh, bring him up on the show? I feel like I say this every week, but shocking, another Tampa Bay Ray infield prospect. <laughs> uh, you know, Kenny, he was a competitive balance pick out of the 21 draft. Uh, he was a big hit tool kid, lots of contact. You know, people are they're skeptical on his power and his run. But, uh, you know, played the complex that year, did very well, came into 2022, uh, missed his whole season due to uh, surgery. But uh, he's coming to 2023 healthy, and he's really starting to pick it up. He's had a little slow start, but, you know, his his run this week has been pretty crazy. We're talking about he's batting 400-plus in the past seven days. Uh, if we're talking next level, he is one of their prospects, I think, it's still early enough that I think he could potentially convert to an outfielder position. Like I, I know, you know, it's just, it's me, you know, guessing, but if we're talking about the profile, you're talking about a six, two, uh, a six, two, you know, roughly 210 pound infielder with a decent enough arm and solid enough defense to play, you know, a corner outfield spot. They really need an outfield prospect. Like all their outfield prospects this year have been, absolutely brutal off to horrible starts. And plus I think the bat is going to carry him to the majors. Like I've seen going back, like looking at his, you know, tool per, you know, projection, I've seen like 50, 55 for the hit tool. I think as he keeps on going, I think he could potentially have a 60 type of hit tool. He's always going to have an average power. And like I said, I don't think he's ever going to be a burner, but you know, watch for him. If he starts getting run at the outfield, I think we're going to see him skyrocket up to lists. That's going to be interesting to keep an eye on here. Uh, do you have any kind of player comps for him, or do you have a idea what his ceiling could be? He kind of reminds me of a young Ian Happ. Okay. Like, and it's kind of, yeah, you know, cookie cutter type of comp, but 
just the way that he barrels up baseballs, just he's more advanced than where he should be right now. And you can definitely tell it in how he's playing. All right. I like it. Cooper Kinney. Our other player that we're keeping an eye on is Drew Gilbert of the Houston Astros right now in high A ball at 22 years of age. Got a 342 batting average with a 644 slug in 81 plate appearances right now with five home runs, three steals, uh, and 12 RBI, 301 ISO. He's doing a little bit of everything here, Mike. And it's kind of interesting with the Houston Astros because you look at them as a juggernaut type of team, but their outfield isn't great. Uh, so there is a path for him if, if he continues to eventually, you know, be one of the guys that could uh, make an impact there someday. But let's talk about today and what he's doing right now in high A ball. Yeah, Drew Gilbert, I did want to talk about him early this season. He was the first round pick for the Astros 28th overall this year. And I, I put him at the top of the list of the extra players when we did the first year player draft episode. And I was wavering on that for a couple hours before our episode. So I'm kind of wishing I had been more pushy with that. But uh, I really like him. In he has a, on fan graphs, he has listed as a plus hit tool with plus speed. And so what I was saying back then was, if he if, if the Astros are able to get some power out of him, he could be a really well-rounded player. And I'm seeing that right now: 300 ISO, five home runs, and you know, 81 plate appearances. I really like this guy. Uh, he was the best hitter on the best college team during the regular season last year at Tennessee, I believe. He ended up dislocating his elbow and only played nine games last year as a pro. So that kind of influenced his first year player draft uh, stock, I think, a little bit. I think this guy's going to end up being one of the best picks from the first year player draft this last class. He's got premium bat speed, above average to plus runner. Like I said, he is listed for plus speed, but he hasn't shown the willingness to steal like all the time. He's good at stealing, but He's not one of those guys like Klaus A that just has the green light at all times. So the, the team would kind of have to make him steal more. If, and he could be successful if he did. He's got a big arm too. He's athletic, can play in center field or move over to left. This, this guy is just exciting to me, especially with this early power development. Now, I do want to see this translate to double A because it's a college bat. You know, when you're in high A and you're an advanced college bat, I, there's some skepticism about the stats. But overall... I couldn't be more thrilled with what's going on right here. I definitely think this guy is going to be well with inside the top 100 lists when they're updated, maybe even top 50, maybe even higher than that. I could be underestimating this, but uh, basically I would just target him in any kind of league right now. I think he's morphing into a five category player in an organization that's good, that has a good lineup, always good players around him. And the Astros took him in the first round. They have high hopes for him. I, I think he's a big part of their future. And it's going to be a big part of fantasy futures as well. That's exciting to hear. Drew Gilbert is somebody that uh, could be helping your fantasy team out for years to come. So keep an eye on him and what he's going to be doing for those Houston Astros. Our last segment, who's next players that we're predicting are next for the call up. And I'll be honest, Justin uh, Foscu of the Texas Rangers is a name I'm not familiar with. Normally when we get to this section, I have a pretty good idea of most of the guys you choose. Uh, you guys pick for this part. But I'm not familiar with him. Obviously, the Rangers have a hole in the middle infield right now with Corey Seeker out of the lineup. And in AAA, you know, pretty solid numbers in what is it, 82 or 112 plate appearances, a 269 batting average, three home runs and four steals. The K rate being under 10% is insane. So he's making a lot of contact, it seems like, Vinny. Um, obviously, you're excited for him. You're think he's going to get the call here is he somebody that you should be looking for to actually contribute for your fantasy teams this season yeah um Foscu, you know he's really he's really flown under the radar since being drafted 14th overall i think you know that 2020 class i say it i swear every week but it is one of the best classes i think we've ever seen if we're talking draft wise like he does everything good like he is a good hit tool he's good with power he's very underrated defensively. You know, he could steal maybe 10, 15 bags. He's not on the Rangers 40 man roster, but let, if any injury on top of Corey Seager happens, I, or, um, yeah, on top of Corey Seager. So if anyone else goes down, Foscu has to be the next guy because the only guy left on their 40 man roster is, uh, Acuna Jr. And they're not going to jump him from high A. But yeah, 
I still think that he could easily replace, you know, Ezekiel Pagan or Josh Smith out of a job if he gets called up. Like, I think he has that much draft capital and he has that kind of loud tools to be an everyday regular for Texas. Like, he, his bat just has like a different thump to it when it's in a lineup. And, you know, you know, Texas, Texas loves their first round picks. Yeah. Um, now, what do you think is the is the best part of his profile? The fact that he makes so much contact? Is he somebody you could see hitting 20 home run power? Like, what is the appeal to him? If I were to go look at the waiver wire today and I have in a, a categories league, is there something that he contributes more than anything else or just all around? Yeah, I think the most tantalizing tool about him is that he's very patient at the plate. He will get mm-hmm. you walks. Plus he will get on base. Like he's very, he's a very solid average walk guy. Like if we're talking a hitter, you know, probably batting, you know, three, four, maybe five in a lineup to find off of a waiver that could potentially give you a two seventy with, you know, a lot of walks. Like this is your guy. He's Mm -hmm. probably rostered in dynasty people. You know, he was a big pick back in 2020. If people stuck with him, like he's been successful all the way through, but, he just hasn't been loud enough to like sound all the alarms on his stock. But yeah, he's a very sneaky hold, I think, for this year in Dynasty and Redraft. All right. Let's go to our last player here. And this one is definitely a little bit more common, is or popular, I should say, is Colton Kowser of the Baltimore Orioles. I, I've kind of been waiting for him to get the call up. He hasn't quite gotten it yet, uh, but he's been doing really well in AAA. A 324, 457, 549 slash line with five home runs, 23 RBIs, four steals. The K to walk, not bad at all. And he's got a 225 ISO. Uh, I would love to see him in a Baltimore Orioles uniform at the big league level here, Mike. I'm hoping that this is the week he gets the call. Yeah, like uh, like we've seen for the last few weeks, there just seems to be a flood of pitching prospects, especially coming up through the system. So it's getting harder and harder to pick players. I actually probably would say Matthew Libertor is the most likely, but we just talked about him recently. So Kowser, I decided to go with here because he's been good this year. He's reduced his strikeout rate by 9% from where it was at AAA last year. And I should I should start by saying, I mean, this was a the number five overall pick when he was drafted a few years ago. I, I'm looking at his profile here. They they say he has a below average hit tool. He has struck. It's shown some strikeout concerns, but I, I think that's a little bit too harsh on him. They're saying he has average power. I think that's a little too harsh on him as well. And above average speed, he's above average fielder. So I believe those two parts of it. So the Orioles are going to want to get his speed and his defense abilities into the lineup. There are some concerns about what level of power he'll get to and where his hit tool will fall. So it's like, but it's like, if he shows improvements there, like I'm already seeing, then, then basically I just think he's underrated overall. I've actually seen some people, I believe Eric Cross has him in the top 15 or something. I'm not ready to go there because I don't think his upside is to that level. I do think he's going to be a very good pro, a long time pro, a long time starter who could work his way into the top of lineup and be really better than I'm suggesting. But uh, I, I just think this guy's someone that's close. You know, the reason I chose to put him in the call-up section instead of the player of the week is because, you know, he's had 130 plate appearances. You know, I, I kind of follow that, like, what, what teams are pushing their players quickly or playing them a lot. Like, I remember mentioning Edward Julian was getting the most plate appearances or Heston Kerstad was getting a lot of plate appearances in the Arizona Fall League. And and this is – this I look at that sort of stuff because it, it shows me that teams are trying to, trying to get them – develop trying to get them pushed along quicker trying to get them made up for lost time and stuff like that so i I think kowser is going to be a starter for the orioles this season whenever he does make the call i'm not super confident it's going to be this week necessarily but uh he's showing that he's better than the triple a level and looking at his profile here looking at his stats i do think he's probably going to struggle a little bit his first time up in the majors but then once he's used to it he's going to adjust and I, i think he's going to be a guy that people want on their teams all right, Colton Cows are hoping, man. Next week, we would love to be able to talk about you in our notable promotion section. Uh, that's going to do it, though, for this week. Please make sure you guys are liked and subscribed to the YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of The Call Up there. Podcast version drops every single Saturday, so you will be able to hear that on the podcast if you prefer that platform, and ratings and reviews are always appreciated. But for Mike, for Vinny, I'm David. We will catch you guys next week on The Call Up.